Hey, scholars, one of the things that we are is a world civilizations class. And this means really a lot, a lot of implications to this. And one of the things is, is, is we're following that definition of civilization as it sort of works its way through uh, history coming out of the Latin and the Greek and stuff as civics and politics and things like that. So what is the role of Alexander the Great? What is the role? He, Aristotle taught this guy. And what are the great problems with Aristotle, Alexander the Great is we don't really know what he wanted to do with the world he conquered. We have some indications, and people have made up things and stuff like that. But the problem is, is that, is that uh, he creates a situation that other people have to make into something. And so in that sense, for our class, Alexander the Great is not important. He is, he's a conqueror, <laughs> got piles of them, man. Uh, he is like Cyrus uh, in the sense that he picks up on, uh, he just keeps conquering things. Um, so he's really hard to figure out. He's not a very pleasant character. He's, he's great for movies, great, you know, this is one of the things that separates what we're trying to do in a college history class than, uh, you know, we're not doing the sort of standard history of wars and, and just sort of... Uh, greatness as defined by power. No, uh, civilization's not really that. I hope you've realized that already. It's, it's so much about the restraint of power, the, the checks and balances on power, the, the uh, term limits on power, the, the responsibilities of power. And then with Ashoka, we've seen a, an emperor who was this kind of emperor, you know, out there conquering and and, uh, and then he re feels remorse. And that remorse pushes him to a higher level of thinking in which ahimsa, nonviolence, becomes such an important thing. And we have Ashoka as a great model of Buddhist emperor in South Asia. Alexander the Great is no model for anything, okay? Um, so people try, uh, people try to make him into a great warrior, okay? And this I have problems with. Um, basically, here's your standard map of Alexander the Great. Okay, so, so these are battles. You battle, battle, battle. And then no battle, 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 no battle. That's because an empire is easy to overthrow. Because once you remember when remember when Artemisia in Herodotus senses the Battle of Salamis is going badly, and so she's going to, she, her responsibility changes. She is a queen, a client queen of Xerxes, who's on the hill. She has a responsibility to fight for Xerxes, but she does not have a responsibility to die for Xerxes and to lose her men for Xerxes. And so when the battle starts to go south, she is going to actually ram her way out and get, get out of the battle and protect her people because the loyalty is superficial in empires. You know, we saw this with Cyrus to the Jews and stuff like that. So this is the Persian Empire. How do you flip it? Well, you win a few battles and then the loyalty and basically the emperor is, is fleeing by this time. Uh, the, the, mo the, the momentum is all on Alexander's side. And so therefore, um, the rest of the place just flip flops. Okay. You just Go into Babylon, go into Susa, go into Persepolis without fighting, without great battles, okay? Interesting trip over here, and we're going to talk about Alexandria today as the legacy of all this. But is the, is the Alexander's idea that he might be a, a, a god. His mother, his mother had a very bad relationship with her, her husband, and and uh, told, uh, according to Plutarch, told, told Alexander that he was the son of a god, not his, his father, Philip. So, um, seriously whacked out dude. You know, so uh, what we want to do is sort of see what happens after Alexander. After Alexander the Great is when his generals, his cohort, his, these people, he had these Greek folks from Macedonia, 
who he had he had been with probably all of his life, probably also imbibed Arist Aristotle's teachings when they were young. But they split the empire into um, four parts here. The uh, you know the Antigonids, which you'll later get that you know, Sophocles play Antigone and stuff. That that's a family dynasty, the Antigone family. They take the old Macedonian homeland, okay? Uh, the Attalids take, you know, up here into uh, what is uh, now Turkey, okay? The Seleucid dynasty, Seleucius, takes most of this, okay? And this is going to be a great center of power and wealth for him. And then Ptolemy will take Egypt. And so these are folks that split this up and do different things with what they've got. And they work, do interesting things, but it's, it is Ptolemy who does the most interesting things. Two cities we should note are set up, Antioch and Alexandria, uh, come out of this. And we're going to talk about Alexandria. But at the time of Jesus, Antioch, as we'll talk about, is maybe even the largest city of the whole empire. You know, Rome is sort of a frontier city. And then Alexandria has this tremendous reputation for intellectual life that we're going to talk about at the time of Jesus. So most Jewish scholars, most of the Jewish scholars, textual scholars, stuff like that, live in Alexandria, you know, at least the greatest of them. And then with the development of Christianity, Christians are going to be first called Christians when they flee to Antioch, and that's going to be their Greek name, Christian. Christ is a Greek term, okay? People. So, but it's in Alexandria that Christian education, Christian, a lot of Christian ways of thinking are going to be developed mostly in Alexandria. So these, we want to get a handle on this, especially today, Alexandria, okay? Um, I've got you reading this uh, Frankly, I think uh, uh, odd essay. It spans a, a lot of time, but it's called Educating Bees. And it's built upon these Aristotelian principles of humble think and faith craft that come into Christian education, largely down here in uh, Alexandria, and then spread, okay, into the uh, way of... of uh, of what, how we think er, in an Aristotelian honeybee uh, hive-like way uh, in, in uh, our understanding of popular sovereignty and how that understanding of popular sovereignty also carries into our understanding of how we understand the Bible and how we get the Bible and how we understand the church and things like that. Okay, so let's talk now about Alexandria under Ptolemy. Okay. So Ptolemy is, uh, you know, he's, he's Anthony Hopkins in one of the Alexander the Great movies. It's just sort of fun to see. But uh, Ptolemy is uh, interesting as, a, as one of these political leaders, key to civilization, because when he talks about, when he gets what he wants, he's got, he's got Egypt, this tremendously wealthy land that produces so much food and all sorts of stuff. It's just, He's a Greek coming in there and is, what do I do? And he decides to do something good. He decides to do something interesting. Decides to do something that advances civilization. And so he uh, develops what was apparently a uh, city first done, you know, hoped for by Alexander. He had, Alexander named a lot of cities after himself. And... Um, and then uh, built a, a sort of Greek colony on the upper edge of, of the delta. See, in the, this is very loose soil. It's very temperamental, very uh, uh, you know, fragile in many ways. This Herodotus, remember, it talked about how Egypt is growing. It's the gift of the Nile. And up there in that delta is growing. But you're going to get out on that land out there, and he's going to create a... a a trade network that's going to build up the wealth of Alexandria. And for the trade network, it's very important to create a, a lighthouse. And so the most famous lighthouse 
in history. It's the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which this is a idea of what it looked like, the island of Pharos. It's one of the, what's called the seven wonders of the world. In this Hellenistic world that we're going to start talking about, and by Hellenistic, we mean Greekish. Hellas is Greek. Istic, ist is, you know, people who are Greeks doing things. And ik, stuff of people who are Greeks doing things, you know. And so Hellenistic, or just Greekish culture, it comes from this Alexander spreading it all around. And as subsequent to that, then Seleucus and Ptolemy and the, uh, you know, these folks making something of it in these different regions. And then the one who's going to make the most of it is, is Ptolemy down in Egypt. Okay. But one of the Hellenistic traits is to list things. Romans love this. Is this they're Hellenists. You see, the Romans are Hellenistic. And they, they love to make lists. <laughs> it's sort of fun. But seven, we've already seen this list of the seven wise men of the ancient world, of which Solon and Lycurgus are on it. But then you have the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it's sort of a checklist. If you're rich and powerful and you want to tour and get educated and stuff, you can, you can do all seven. But the... Uh, Lighthouse in Alexandria is one. Halicarnassus gets the museum, the mausoleum, you know. Uh, see, not museum, mausoleum. And then Ephesus has this towering statue, and that's, that comes up with the story of Paul in, in uh, the book of Acts, you know, because there's a little riot in Ephesus about the, you know, what's going to happen when Christianity comes in there. And then, you know, this is the setup. So, we're talking about this library, and so when you go to Alexandria today, they have built a very beautiful library there. One of my students was there, sent me a picture, which I encourage all of you to do. Um, and, uh, and just as a memory, a, a, a symbolic uh, memorial to the, basically uh, about 600 years and spreading out to 900 years that Alexandria was, a type of intellectual capital, uh, uh, just an amazing 